Peaceful protests initially arose in Baltimore. However, rioting, looting, and arson broke out on the day of Freddie Gray's funeral. Although the Baltimore Police Department, they initially restrained themselves from physically engaging with protesters at, during the onset of demonstrations. However, the police response became more militarized as protests also became violent. The deaths of both Michael Brown and Freddie Gray gave rise to the Black Lives Matters movement, which emerged in 2013 after the murder acquittal of George Zimmerman and the death of Trayvon Martin, who at the time was a 17-year-old African-American boy. Because many African-Americans were tired of the extrajudicial killings of Blacks by police and self-declared vigilantes, this movement really unfolded as a call to action, demanding uh, changes with how police deal with minorities, but also calling for changes or calling for an end to systemic uh, racism that exists in this country. So the deaths of both Michael Brown and Freddie Gray were uh, two of several high profile killings that gave impetus to the Black Lives Matters movement. And uh, protests at each of these sites really brought out decades of pent up emotions of outrage, um, frustration and anger from, from the Black community. And the use of repressive uh, police tactics um, against protesters at each of these locations confirmed to many the continued racism and discrimination that many Blacks experience and um, have suffered and continue to suffer at the hands of various state institutions, including the police. So in the midst of both of these high profile killings, many advocates have argued that diversifying these forces will help to reduce uh, police violence against people of color. Racial diversity has long been an issue with US police departments. Uh, when modern policing began in the first decade of the 19th century in the United States, there were, there were no black police officers. Only after radical reconstruction, which started in 1867, were black Americans able to move from enslavement and segregation to working in historically white institutions, such as police departments. From reconstruction to the 1940s, there were few black officers. These few generally worked in plain clothes um, and they were assigned to patrol largely black neighborhoods. During the segregation era, era from 1890 to 1960s, the South rarely uh, hired blacks for their police force and in the North, people of color also remain underrepresented. And many police departments did not allow blacks to arrest whites or to work with white officers. However, the 1960s and 70s marked a central change in American policing. Police and Black protesters, they visibly clashed in riots and civil rights demonstrations. Powerful images of officers turning dogs and fire hoses on Black uh, protesters struck a public uh, chord and really provoked strong criticism of the police. The Watts riots of 1965 also prompted a vocal outcry that something had to be done in order to improve uh, community relations between the police and citizens. Racial representation in police departments came to be viewed as necessary, eventually leading to the employment of more Blacks as law enforcement officers. In 1960, approximately 3.6% of sworn urban officers were Black. By 2007, that number had increased to 12%. And as this graph shows that in 1987, uh, racial ethnic minorities made up about 13% of the police department. And by 2013, that number had increased to 27%. And of the 701,000 full-time sworn officers working in 2016, uh, just about approximately 27% were officers of color. Uh, with 71% uh, white, 11.4% um, black, and 12.5% Hispanic. Um, and so as the proportion of minority officers has nearly doubled in 30 years, growing from 14% to 27% from 1987 to 2016. However, minorities hires still lag behind the general population where nearly 40% uh, of Americans are non-white. And small departments tend to be less diverse as well. Forces serving fewer than 10,000 people are 87% white, while the largest departments are on average around 50% 50, 50 white. And so the integration of Blacks into historically white agencies has generally been viewed as a way to reduce racial tension. But the question is, is that really the case? 
So assuming a relationship between police, uh, between race and police behavior, many academics and commentators have put forth the theory of community accountability, <clears throat> which means that police agencies would be answerable to the communities that they are designated to uh, uh, protect and serve. This theory holds that one way to reduce conflict between the police and black citizens is to hire more black officers and assign them to largely black neighborhoods. The belief is that greater diversity in the police force will foster more impartial law enforcement and also help to bolster police uh, civilian relationships. Um, and so some academics and commissioners and reformers argue that promoting the diversification of law enforcement personnel may help to enhance the legitimacy of police agencies from the point of view of residents and also improve the quality of police minority uh, relations. The theory of minority threat offers an alternative viewpoint. So this is grounded in co the conflict theory of law and the minority threat theory maintains that racial and ethnic minorities are often perceived as um, threatening to dominant groups and that both uh, white civilians and officers may associate the perceived threat of minorities with uh, the threat of crime. And so since law enforcement may share these per perceptions, they might respond to racial minorities with increased levels of crime control. However, black officers may not be exempt from, uh, from viewing uh, poor African Americans as a threat to their well being. Some may be pressured to use coercive crime control uh, strategies against blacks because of peer expectations within the police department. Um, and others may perceive black citizens as challenging their authority and therefore um, deserving of greater uh, crime control. So I want to turn attention to uh, Ferguson and Baltimore residents' views of black officers. Um, and so I examined residents' experiences um, uh, with uh, black officers as well as their, their perceptions of black officers in comparison to white officers. So I uh, consider how residents' race structures their attitudes towards black officers, and I also pay specific attention to how residents interpret and make sense of them. And such an examination is particularly necessary given that many communities of color have called for police departments to recruit more people of color to reduce police violence against them. But it's also possible that the presence of black police officers can help to ease some of the racial tensions during times of uh, demonstrations and protests where, where demonstrators are standing up against police violence. So this is part of a broader study in which I interviewed a, a total of 152 residents um, from Ferguson and Baltimore. And of those residents, 65 police incident descriptions and perceptions of black police were documented. Uh, 30 incidents and, percep and perceptions of black officers were made in Ferguson and 35 were made in, amongst residents in Baltimore. Of the 65 incidents and perceptions that were reported, 45 were assessments of black officers, followed by 17 who had direct encounters with black officers, and three that had vicarious or indirect experiences with black police officers. So among those who reported their encounters and views of black officers, three sometimes contradictory themes came up repeatedly. The first being that black officers are viewed as courteous and understanding. The second is that black police officers were depicted as aggressive in nature. And the final theme is that black law enforcement was described as having or as facing occupational socialization on the job. So I'll, I'll go ahead and talk about each of these themes that came up. So the first it was that about one quarter of residents uh, who I spoke with viewed um, black officers in a favorable light. Specifically, both uh, uh, Ferguson and Baltimore residents perceived that black officers enforced the law more um, fairly than white officers and that black officers were more courteous and respectful when they policed. Interestingly, such perceptions were more common amongst women. Um, and when men did make such assertions, they came either from white males or from black males who did not report having a direct um, encounter with black officers. And so for the most part, black participants felt that, uh, some black participants felt that black police officers could relate to them in ways that white officers could not. For example, Rachel states that um, 
I think as a black police officer, he understands and he sees the situation better than a white police officer would understand and see it because he identifies with us. Likewise, Daniela states that I feel like if you have a white officer and he may be patrolling a black neighborhood or just patrolling around the city, he already has his head, he already has his head in, he already has a stereotype where a black police officer, he may think that way, but one of those boys could be maybe his nephew, his cousin, a relative or something. And they may be taken back and not so much already to assume that they're going to do something bad. And so given the shared racial background, there were some black residents from Ferguson who said that black police officers were better able to understand the black community and, and culture than, white, than their white counterparts. For example, Mike states that black cops usually know about the neighborhood more and they rarely view us as bad, bad people, especially young black men. So this view is supported by research that shows that black officers demonstrate greater understanding of black culture due to their greater knowledge of the community and its norms, which can alleviate mistrust. Such views, however, were not just attributed specifically to black officers. Most residents accepted that police officers in general are better able to identify with their own racial or ethnic group. For example, Brian states that with a lot of Hispanic police officers, maybe they relate a little bit more with the Hispanic community, just like Blacks can. <clears throat> and so as Brian spoke to me, and I am a Black woman, he admitted to me that, quote, with your experience, you know, being Black, you can relate on some level that with me being a Caucasian, I'm not exposed to. You know, I didn't live in that area, so you see what I'm saying, it can only help. And while I myself have never resided in a Black inner city neighborhood, Brian essentially assumed that shared um, racial, having a shared racial background can help to improve this relationship. And so overall, Black and white residents who favorably evaluated law enforcement emphasize their ability to both connect to Black civilians and their communities. And while these accounts suggest that hiring more Black officers might be a viable option for improving police uh, minority relations, thus supporting the community accountability uh, theory, recall that such views were more common amongst women and less common among Black men who actually had direct encounters with Black officers. In fact, we'll see in a moment that while a number of study participants um, had favorable perceptions of Black police officers, Others believe that, they, that black officers responded more harshly towards black civilians. So in their accounts of black officers, it was not uncommon for um, residents to contend that they operate rather aggressively when they encounter black civilians. Among police incidences and perceptions of black officers, 25% reported such aggression. And the vast majority of these reports came from uh, those who resided in Baltimore who actually had direct encounters with black officers. And so black Baltimoreans stated that black police were generally aggressive in their policing tactics. For example, Chandri states that in addition to white officers, black officers are also using excessive force. <clears throat> and uh, Jamia states that the black that the black officers are sometimes worse than their white ones. They get louder and they get more violent. Similarly, Davina states that, you know, uh, the black officers, they curse the black guy out and whatever. They sling him around because I've seen them sling my son around. They sling him around. They throw him up against a wall, just like Freddie Gray. And so Davina's views of black officers here was tied to having observed the differential treatment that they displayed towards men, including the harsh treatment of her son. And so as a result of her vicarious or indirect experience, she ultimately viewed police officers, black or white, in an unfavorable light. So consistent with prior research, the current findings as we uh, the current findings reveal that Black residents, specifically from Baltimore, reported uh, both having direct and indirect experiences of being treated harshly by Black officers. And so having more Black officers does not necessarily equate to a better treatment of Blacks. It's important to note that in the aftermath of Michael Brown and Freddie Gray's death, the Department of Justice conducted their own independent investigation uh, bo uh, both of these police departments. And they concluded that both departments engaged in a pattern of unconstitutional, racially biased policing. 
Uh, this is true even in Baltimore, where at the time of uh, Freddie Gray's death, nearly half of the police force was black and the police chief was black himself. And um, but the report by the Department of Justice found that in Ferguson and Baltimore, Blacks were much more likely to be stopped, searched, and arrested, but yet less likely to be found in possession of a contraband. And so evidence suggests that the diversification of police departments in and of itself is insufficient to actually improving police minority relationships. So police forces are also well known for their use of socialization to try to change the attitudes and behaviors of their employees. So it's not uncommon for organizational administrators to instill a common set of assumptions within their employees and really inculcate a worldview that values um, organizational loyalty above uh, personal beliefs. So scholars have stated that the degree of cohesion and solidarity among officers has been noted noted as a conspicuous yet unusual component of the police profession, and it's been described as a quote unquote blue wall. So as such, this profession reflects fraternal support and emphasize adherence to the norms of a police subculture. And so by police subculture, I'm referring to the distinct set of values and beliefs that shape police officers' behaviors. So residents in the study had a lot to say about their perceptions of their local police departments. In all, 44% emphasize the police subculture and the challenges that Black officers face on the job. Specifically, our Black residents in both cities believe that Black police officers that they often attempted to conform to the informal norms of occupational culture within the police department. For instance, Marcel stated what the Black, what the black officer is trying to do is trying to fit in because he belongs to a club. Marcel's comments suggest that Black officers seek acceptance in the police organization and that career advancement is tied to adopting the, the standards of police culture. The theme of proving oneself was common as residents believe that officers often try to demonstrate to their colleagues that the color of the uniform trumped their racial identity. Not only did these uh, participants see no difference in treatment between officers of different races, some believe that black officers had uh, been tainted by, uh, by their occupational association with white officers. <clears throat> A considerable body of research has shown that white officers generally perceive and treat black civilians negatively. Reflecting the dominant attitudes of the majority population towards people of color in the United States, white police officers often negatively stereotype uh, African Americans as being quote unquote criminals. Residents who were interviewed perceived that rather than defy or challenge these stereotypes, some black officers were more apt to conform to uh, the occupational roles, which entailed uh, stereotyping people of color, in particular uh, black individuals. And so in the case of police, all officers are dealing with enormous systemic and cultural forces that build racial bias against minority groups, particularly um, black African Americans. For example, Alonzo states that it's not a black or white thing, it's a blue thing. And the blue cop position referred to by Alonzo is the idea that the color of the uniform is really the only color that matters. Faced with the pressure or the desire to conform to informal rules, Black officers may remain silent even after witnessing injustice. In fact, uh, many Black residents here believe that the code of silence, which shields officers from scrutiny, was often at play. For example, I'll show you in a moment that Maurice, he, deal, he details an incident in which uh, Ferguson, as well as the St. Louis County Police, they barged into his house because they were looking for his brother. And Maurice describes having been verbally and physically assaulted by six police officers in his house, even though he responded to their questions and he did not resist these officers. Uh, so Maurice states that police were calling me the N-word and stuff like that. And the black officer didn't say nothing. I don't know if it was because he was at work or you know what I mean. And so what remained particularly disconcerting for Maurice was the fact that the black officer on duty remained silent while, this, while the white officer was hurling racial slurs at him. Black participants, however, seemed to be aware of the bind that some uh, black officers found themselves in. So that, that is, they exist in a state of dual loyalty. So on the one hand, um, as, black, as black individuals, they may relate to and be committed to the black community. 
uh, and their awareness of previous police violence and the likelihood that many officers live in or, uh, or may live near the community um, uh, suggests that they would be more empathetic to black civilians. Yet on the other hand, they remain committed to a contrasting set of occupational values and obligations that may stereotype uh, black individuals. For example, Junior states it's not about the race of the cops, it's about the racism of the actual system that they, that they protect and serve. So research shows that, police, that the police code of silence not only exists, but it can also breathe, support, and cultivate other forms of unethical behavior in the police force. In some, case, in some cases, the insularity of the police subculture not only uh, supports informal norms about police violence or mistreatment, but it can also diminish police accountability to civilians that they are called to uh, protect and serve. Civilians, including the participants in uh, the study, are certainly not privy to the ins and outs of the police uh, department or to the occupational culture of policing. Uh, but the very perception that officers, including black officers, are socialized to police people of color in disadvantaged uh, communities more aggressively than uh, whites or those residing in more affluent neighborhoods certainly has negative implications. Racial minorities' perceptions that police forces as a whole treat um, uh, communities of color unfairly and disrespectfully, this only serves to undermine their trust and cooperation with the police. <clears throat> so would having a higher percentage of black officers in Ferguson or Baltimore have changed how the protests unfolded? It's possible, but probably not. So the research that I've done indicates that some residents, especially those who resided in Baltimore, believe that simply hiring a higher proportion of black officers in the police force does not necessarily indicate that the department will function better. If black officers are hired and if they are placed in, in, a, in an occupational setting that socializes them to embrace the stereotypes of black civilians as threatening, then it would be also illogical to expect police community relationships to improve. <clears throat> there are some studies that uh, conclude that when black officers are represented in high enough numbers, more than 40% um, within the police department, that they are more likely to uh, represent the interests of black civilians, as they are, they'll be less likely to fear the consequences from the department or derision from their peers. <clears throat> in particular, uh, there are some criminologists who assert that there is an inflection point at which black officers may be, become less likely to discriminate against black civilians and they'll be more inclined to assume a minority advocacy role or to become more uh, neutral enforcers of the law. And so this, uh, thus, this engages, um, this would result in active representation. However, the current research um, shows that even in Baltimore, again, where nearly half the police force is black, where the police chief is also, is also African-American, um, it shows that residents encount do encounter discrimination and they do encounter mistreatment even from black officers. And so this is likely because police minority interactions, they are also embedded within an ecological uh, context, which is rooted in historical uh, racial tensions and geographically uh, geographical concentrations of socioeconomic disorder. So in the United States, in general, Blacks disproportionately reside in socially disorganized neighborhoods that are burdened or characterized by high rates of unemployment, uh, poverty, and decay. And so Ferguson and Saint, the St. Louis metropolitan area, as well as the city of Baltimore, they all have long histories of racial isolation and concentrated disadvantage. Research shows that a high rates of poverty, disorder, and crime all affects the type and quality of policing that takes place within these neighborhoods and that civilians receive. And low-income residents are often uh, the targets of police surveillance and violence. Consequently, distrust and animosity characterizes a lot of these police minority relationships. So what would need to happen in order to reduce police violence um, particularly against black people. So based upon what I found in my research is that ending um, the killings of uh, black and brown individuals is not going to happen by doubling down on investments in the police. Uh, America's long history of state sanctioned violence against black Americans reflect persistent inequities within the criminal legal system. 
So rather than investing more dollars into the police and into prisons, investments need to be made in individuals and communities that law enforcement police. So as a nation, uh, this, the government has been tough on crime for decades by investing heavily in policing and imprisonment as a means of solving everyday structural problems that disproportionately affects Black people. But what if instead of <clears throat> being tough on crime, we are tough on the underlying issues that cause crime? or that criminalize people. So imagine if resources were distributed away from the criminal justice institution and into communities. And imagine if funds were spent on prevention and intervention initiatives for at-risk youth and young adults who have much promise. Imagine if these resources were spent on addressing mental health, substance abuse, and homelessness, because currently the way these individuals are often treated is they are often ostracized, marginalized, and ultimately criminalized. Imagine if these resources were spent on uh, bringing more jobs into the communities where living wages were paid and quality education is provided. So ending the killing of Black people uh, really requires doubling down on investments in communities, not the police or the criminal justice system, and redistributing uh, resources away from the criminal justice system into uh, cultivating institutions within poor communities is vital. And when we break these structural systems of oppression and also seek an alternative vision for safety away from the hands of the police and into the powers of communities, only then will we begin to really put an end to denying a lot of marginalized people their humanity. But I also understand that that would uh, require uh, massive efforts to try to address educational and economic inequities uh, that exist within this nation. So in the interim, some experts have stressed the need to address America's history of racial injustice within the criminal justice system to rebuild trust. So some are taking efforts to foster reconciliation with minority communities um, that have lost trust in the police. So this uh, trust building uh, process involves having uh, frank um, conversations between police and the people that they, serve, that they are to protect and serve to address tensions, grievances, as well as misconceptions. And so sincere effort by law enforcement to act differently and to do better can also reveal common grounds with community members and facilitate new ways in which, in which both sides can work together to decrease violence. And so more of this needs to be done in order to uh, improve relationships and build trust between uh, law enforcement and communities of color. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kobina, for that uh, presentation. Um, I think that gave us uh, a lot to think about. Certainly appreciate your work and the perspective that you bring to the conversation, especially at this, at this point in time. Um, I didn't see any uh, questions in, in the chat box. Um, uh, so uh, I, will, I will gather that people are thinking about what you've had to say and uh, your recommendations as well. Obviously, there's a lot of discussion going on in the Michigan legislature regarding police reform. So uh, your information, knowledge, perspective is all, is all very timely. So if there are no questions right now, um, we'll move on to our next presenters. Um, and that would be uh, Drs. Jeff Rochek and Dr. Scott Wilf, both again, Associate Professors of Criminal Justice at Michigan State University, who have done some work evaluating the effectiveness of various training programs that we've all been hearing about, such as implicit bias, de-escalation, as well as others. So uh, with that, I'll introduce uh, Scott Wolf. Scott? How you doing? Thank you, Arnold. Thank you all for taking time out of your day to be with us and, and discuss police reform and some of the research concerning police reform. As, as Arnold said, my name is Scott Wolf. I'm an associate professor of criminal justice at Michigan State University. And broadly, my research focuses on policing. And over the past couple years, most of my research has revolved in some way around police training and evaluation of the police training. So my colleague and I, Jeff Rojek, will be discussing what works basically in police training or what we know at this point works in police training with you all today. And so our discussion will center around what we know and actually also what we don't know about police training. And then we're going to discuss in detail a promising avenue for police training 
that is the basis of a program Jeff and I and our colleagues recently evaluated. And that training focuses on broad social interaction skill development among police officers. So one of the main reasons we are here today talking about this is almost a month ago, George Floyd was murdered by a Minneapolis police officer, Derek Chauvin, in, in yet another case of excessive police use of force. And this, of course, has led to a new wave of public pressure to engage in police reform. The unfortunate thing is that we in the United States kind of sound like a broken record when it comes to police reform. We've been talking about these issues for a long time, dating back to the Wickersham Commission in 1929, the Kerner Commission in 1967, Knapp Commission in 1970, Christopher Commission in 1991, Mullen Commission in 1992, and then most recently, President Obama's Task Force on 21st Century Policing in 2014. The point here is that when we're discussing issues of police reform, these are old issues. We talked about them for a long time, and in fact, we know how to engage in effective police reform and change. And we think of, when we think about police reform, there's kind of three broad areas that we can target. Um, I think this is a good segue from Dr. Kobina's uh, discussion of police hiring, because that's indeed one of the, the key pinch points when we're talking about some areas of police reform, the police hiring and selection phase. There's also the police policy and other accountability mechanisms that we can target. And then of course, there's police training. And so what this does is begs the question, if, if we know how to engage in police reform, why haven't we done so? Well, the first answer to that question is we have. Um, over the past several decades in particular, US policing has gotten much better and more professional. At the same time, there's a lot of work to do, especially when it comes uh, to police training. And that's what Jeff and I want to talk with you a little bit about today. Unfortunately, there's a disturbing reality in American policing. Our agencies simply lack sufficient training that develops officer skills at interacting with members of the public. This problem largely stems from lack of scientific evidence regarding what works in police training. Academic researchers have sometimes failed to prioritize the evaluation of police training. Sometimes police agencies are unwilling or unable to allow evaluations of training to take place in their departments. And there's a lot of self-professed training experts out there that develop and sell training programs to police agencies and have completely ignored the value of rigorous third-party evaluation. And so what this does is creates a situation whereby police departments throughout our country are using training programs with little to no idea of whether they produce desirable outcomes. And so the issue that we'll be talking about with you is what do we know about what works in police training? So the first group of training programs that we want to discuss today is implicit bias training. We all, as many of us may know, have implicit biases or associations and beliefs, which are automatic mental processes that are largely uncontrollable and unintentional, but they influence our behavior. When you look at the research, there's mixed evidence regarding the extent to which police officers' implicit biases influence their behavior. Some laboratory studies suggest that officers' implicit biases shape their fictional officer behavior. But there's also other evidence that suggests officers' behavior is not influenced by implicit associations. And in fact, some studies show that officers engage in what is sometimes referred to as counter bias or under policing African American suspects. But the reality of the situation is, especially in recent years, even in our own state, of course, we have seen many calls for implicit bias training for police officers. If we all, including officers, have implicit associations or beliefs, let's train them and get rid of them, correct? The problem with that is at this point, we have zero evidence that implicit bias training will change officers' attitudes or behaviors. Right now, there's simply no studies that have been conducted that test whether implicit bias training works specifically among police officers. Furthermore, even if we start to evaluate police trainings of this type, there's little reason to believe that they will help much. A recent meta-analysis, which is a study that combines or synthesizes all of the research on a particular topic, did a meta-analysis on 492 implicit association studies, and it found this. It found that implicit associations, or our implicit biases and beliefs, can sometimes be altered. But the problem is that these changes are usually very small, and across all those studies, there's little evidence 
that they translate into actual change behavior. And so why does this happen? There's two big reasons why this happens. First, implicit associations or biases are very difficult to change and even more difficult to change if we're to hope that they have an impact on actual behavior, for instance, among police officers. The second reason that we have some of these results, especially from this meta-analysis, is that most trainings and interventions are simply too short to even hope that they would matter. We've seen in a number of um, studies about expertise acquisition, trainings in, in various domains, that one or two day training programs are simply not very effective. The problem with most, if not all, implicit bias trainings across the United States that are offered to police officers is they rarely exceed one or two days. So implicit bias training is indeed potentially useful, especially when we're talking about starting the conversation among police officers about racism and bias in their work. But as far as the research evidence goes, the conclusion we have is that implicit bias training will likely not have a significant impact on diminishing excessive use of force by the police. The second area of training that um, has increased in frequency with many agencies across the United States is CIT or crisis intervention training or some form of mental health training that broadly tries to get police officers to develop their skills at dealing with people with mental illness because a lot of the people that they come into contact with are suffering some mental health crisis. There's good news here. There is some evidence to suggest that a lot of these trainings can be beneficial for police officers, but there are two big caveats. CIT training, other mental health training, in order for repetition and skill acquisition to set in, they need to be longer than one or two days. One or two day training programs are not sufficient and they do not produce any meaningful long-term change in attitudes or behavior. The second limitation to CIT training is that it's too narrow. Right? It's valuable training, but the reality is it is only focuses on a very narrow skill development uh, for dealing with one segment of the population. Right? So the conclusion with CIT training is that it may help officers. Indeed, it probably does help officers in some situations, but alone it will not be enough to impact excessive use of force by the police. The third group of training is procedural justice training. This involves officers ensuring that they allow citizens a voice, that they're respectful during their interactions, and that they explain the reasons why they're making particular decisions to the people that they're interacting with. And so of course, training tries to focus on improving that skill set of among officers at dealing with members of the public in a procedurally fair way. Procedural justice is important because it, it, because research shows that when officers are fair during their interactions with the public in a procedurally just way, citizens are more likely to view the police as trustworthy and legitimate. They're more likely to cooperate with officers. They're more likely to obey the law. Um, and they're more likely to offer help to police when they need it. So with respect specifically to procedural justice training, there's some evidence that's emerged over the past two or three years that this training might indeed help improve some attitudes and behaviors among police officers. But similar to our previous conversation about CIT, there's two big caveats. For one, procedural justice training has to be longer than one or two days for repetition and skill acquisition to set in. We see from evaluations of procedural justice training that are one day in length, Typically, those have very little attitude change and almost never a behavioral change. Longer trainings tend to have a, a more sustained effect for officers. And then second, again, the training, while important, is too narrow. Right? It doesn't focus enough on the broad social, annex, social interaction skills that police officers need during their um, everyday interactions with various members of the public. And so our conclusion here is procedural justice training may help probably useful for a lot of police officers, but in isolation, if it's the only training, it will not be enough to impact excessive use of force by the police. The final group of training before we talk about um, broader social interaction training is de-escalation training. This involves teaching officers how to calm down tense situations so they can avoid the encounter resulting in the use of force. Currently, there is no evidence that de-escalation training works for police officers, and that's simply because there's no studies that uh, have offered rigorous evaluations at this point. The good news is there's several studies that are in progress that do show pro promise. 
here again, the caveat is kind of, kind of fourfold. Even if de-escalation is effective, we have to be cautious in moving forward wholesale with requiring or rolling out uh, de-escalation training for our officers because for one, most de-escalation training programs do not focus on developing officer skills of how not to get to a tense situation to begin with, right? And whether de-escalation may be necessary in some situations. Second, it doesn't take into consideration the full dynamic nature and complexity of interacting with people. It focuses on a narrow uh, segment of social interactions. Third, the term tends to alienate police officers. When officers, a lot of officers hear the term de-escalation, they are given the impression that they are the only person in the interaction that will have a say in how that, that citizen encounter will unfold. We know from research that's simply just not true. Um, Citizen behavior, citizen demeanor is one of the biggest predictors of what will happen during a, an interaction. And so the reason we bring this up about alienating officers, if they are not motivated and they are alienated when they walk into the training room, regardless of how good that training will be, it's probably doomed for failure for a, for a lot of those cops in the room. And then last is, again, one or two day trainings are not effective. The problem is that many de-escalation training programs are one and two days. And so our conclusion here is de-escalation training will help, but if offered in isolation and narrowly, it will not be enough to impact excessive use of force by the police. So at this point, I'll turn over uh, to my colleague, Jeff Rojan. Sure, thanks, Scott. Um, I guess the way to transition or frame what we're talking about to the research we did uh, was each of the things you listen to Scott was talking about, we talk about de-escalation, we talk about procedural justice, um, CIT, whatever it may be. Those are individual or elements of social interaction. So for example, very often we train in things like de-escalation. That is one component to, as Scott was alluding to, a dynamic interaction where you often have competing goals that fluctuate between situations. So it's not just, I know a technique of de-escalation. I need to be able to better understand the situation, read when I act, when I reply, when I should behave in that way versus mixing it. And this fits into a, a really a broader longstanding framework and understanding police behavior, police citizen interactions, the social interactions perspective, which has broad reaches well beyond policing in everyday life. Um, but in framing in this sense, we, we conceptualize encounters as these dynamic processes Scott alluded to, which have folded in a way that can escalate or de-escalate into a path of, of moving towards or away from force among many other attributes and dynamics of the situation. And when you look at this, you have a dynamic in which we citizen actors have a degree of agency on both parties. As Scott was alluding to both the officer and the citizen and can have an impact on a degree to which incidents show, go to or avoid incidents resulting in force encounters. Um, in the present setting, we're thinking about police training. We're only thinking about law enforcement officer perspectives and the training and changing the law enforcement behavior. And can we produce a better trained officer to read and engage in interactions with citizens that reduces the likelihood of force while not increasing vulnerability? Because that's going to be a counteracting goal and that you have to compete with. And, and something that's critical, I think, in any of these things we look at, any of these programs, I don't know, you talk about broad based programs um, beyond just policing or holistic change just the styles of policing, you're playing percentages. You're not playing in absolutes. We're not going to eliminate encounters or certain frameworks in part because in this case, when we look at social interactions, the police, we can only shape police behavior so much to control an interaction, which they're also reacting up the behavior of others. So we're trying to reduce the percentage of cases, hopefully, to go to some level of force, whether it be fatality, but even, which is much more prevalent, the more mundane, prosaic kind of like um, physical contact, body control, et cetera. So in trying to understand this and look at programs that are maybe a little more holistic than de-escalation alone or procedural justice, um, we interact with some folks at a group called Polis Solutions and they have a program called Tac Tactics and Trust. And what was fascinating to us is this program is actually a part of a $40 million DARPA Good Strange program. If those are not familiar, DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. And we often think about them in a context of high-end technologies, um, but the U.S. military, and particularly DARPA, funded a tremendous amount of research on social behavioral science. And in this particular context, this program developed in 2010, 
and the recognition you had soldiers deployed in places like Iraq, Iraq Afghanistan, were having tense encounters with citizens or locals and the potential where you have misunderstandings and culture, um, language barriers, um, potential conflict situations, and how do we better come up with training programs that may alter soldier behavior to reduce the likelihood of conflicts in those events. And that, that working group had preeminent uh, scholars in communications, decision making, and uh, language communication patterns, along with folks in the military, and as well as some folks in law enforcement, which was part of this group. And what was seen out of that is like we can take these concepts of how we can put interactions between people who don't really know each other very well, and can we train at least one side of it, in the case, case officer, based on this Good Stranger program, to interact in a way at least reduces the likelihood from things going into a more serious type encounter. So that's largely what we took is this program to go, okay, it has a holistic way. It's going to include these elements of procedural justice, de-escalation, but also decision-making, empathy, cue recognition, all these other broader dynamics of how to read and interact in, in a pre-citizen encounter. Uh, Scott, will you change the slide for me a minute? So just a brief overview, I, I don't want to get too caught in weeds, but just give you a big framework of what the program entailed. So they have the T3 program essentially based on these, this Good Stranger program includes a number of different concepts to train an officer on pattern detection, interaction, engagement, self-control, empathy, air repair, which the idea that when things are not going the way intentions are getting conflict, how do I read the situation better, alter it, de-escalation, effects, awareness, decision-making, and so those are the core concepts, and the program evolves at least the way we had worked with the organization, um, the training organization, is a two-hour base framework in which we brief officers and frame them in these contexts. Then the idea was how do we get individuals to take rough concepts and interact and think about encounters and how they unfold and dynamics them and how we can stop them. So part of the core of their program is to have essentially video-based training exercise and decision exercises. And the foundation of this is interesting. It comes out of some of that Good Stranger project and folks who were doing a fair amount of research and say things like uh, sports psychology and other areas that look at how high performing athletes, for example, make decisions in fast dynamic encounters and where you can essentially stop that encounter and who is better at determining what the situation is performing, how do I interact and, and uh, move next. And so those are some of the scholars based in Good Stranger program. And how do you apply that to a police citizen encounter? So these video-based frameworks are very much a live, usually taken from body cam or some of the framework, police citizen encounter. You break it up in a couple different stop points to start training officers to think about what they have, alternative paths of action, and judging through, and then walking through on the back end debrief these sessions. What it does is it essentially compresses the opportunity to put the concepts into play um, on a situation by situation review of a case. And then the third component is to actually put these in through some type of interactive scenario based training. Uh, they had a program they called Gearing In, but it was basically training officers to better read what are the goals of an individual encounter, because both the police and the citizen have a goal in an encounter, what they want out of it. Um, anywhere from a pot that they both want a positive counter to uh, in a case, maybe if someone's suspected of a crime, they don't want to interact with the police. They want to get away from this situation. So how do you read the goals? How do you identify, or, or come up with the identity of what that individual is in that encounter and create some type of relation with that individual to try to come out with an improved outcome again as best you can? The other component, and I, I kind of got to this of the video training exercises that are roughly about an hour in length, is repetition. Key is repetition, or again, this pulls out of some other broader based research and expert performance outside of policing is the idea of deliberate practice. Scott's already alluded to this and Scott looking at some of the programs. The idea that we're gonna train officers in a one hour session, a one day session or two day session, and somehow they're gonna magically do this is not really founded in any type of research. Uh, you have to look at the idea of how we train people and develop skill sets repetitively over time and reinforce them. And so when this program comes into play, um, I'll show you, in fact, Scott, we hit the next slide. What we did here is we came up with kind of different ways in which we looked at what impact a program like this would have. And it was to have repetition and training. So what we did is something called a randomized control trial. I'm sure many of you are familiar with that. It's used very heavily, sometimes in education, definitely, and medical field. 
Well, we randomly assign people to different groups of either treatment versus no treatment, in this case, training versus no training. And in, and in addition, here, we looked at levels or dosage of training. You can again, think about this in the context of a medical field, it would be a parallel. We looked at two agencies, one was Tucson, Arizona, the other was Fayetteville, North Carolina. We basically took um, half of their patrol force uh, in a case of care, I think it was about 180 officers, right, Scott, in Fayetteville, and I think about 250 or so in uh, Tucson. And that was just the patrol officers. We're not taking specialized units or anything like that because these people work in common environments. And we randomly split them into these three different groups. Um, some got no training. Some got what we call low-dose training. So they went through the basic um, T3 concept session. They had over about every other week basis, they had went through these one hour video training exercises and they had one day of scenario sessions. The other group we call Hydros, we have basically a very similar frame, except we increased the dosage, if you will. So they had the concept session, but they had uh, more than double the number of video sessions and twice the number of video interactive or scenario interactive kind of in-person sessions. So this was the framework. And the goal when we look at this is Essentially, we're going to have a group of officers that if they're randomly signed, they're spread across these groups, and then we're going to put them through this treatment period, and then we're going to essentially measure the behavior differences on the back end, well, excuse me, attitudes, orientations, and behavioral differences to see if the training makes a difference and at what level the dosage maybe makes a difference. Scott, we hit the um, next slide. And so these are the things we looked at. We surveyed officers pre and post tests to look at variations in attitudes and orientations. We interviewed officers to look at their, particularly the nuances of the receptivity of the program and how they viewed it and what they see works or doesn't work. Uh, we surveyed officers for attitudinal changes. And you know, we put them in a context about what they prioritize, and Scott will get into this in a minute, in encounters, whether it's communication strategies, making connection, uh, just behavior, control of the situation, et cetera. And then we also look at behavioral change, in this case, use of force reports, which is, at some level, I'll say it's difficult because it, despite uh, perceptions, use of force is not very prevalent um, in documented use of force cases. Even in agencies that have very thorough documentation, it's a very small percentage of encounters, as we even see on nationwide scales and things like the police public contact survey. Um, but this is the framework. We took this program that takes this holistic approach to try to train officers to better read situations and record in a capacity or re respond in a capacity that hopefully reduces the percentage, percentage of cases that turn into use of force encounters in particularly, but even negative encounters or confrontational encounters, and then measure that program looking at these different levels of training we provided. Scott, you wanna? Uh, maybe before we move on, we've had a question come up. Roughly how many officers were evaluated in this study? So what were the total numbers on uh, um, framework yes. between overall? It's about 400? Yeah, so a total of about 400, so just under 200 that were in the experimental condition and about 200 in the control. Thank you. Yeah. And I said it's, it's rough in the sense that we have, um, in natural when you use experimental designs, you have attrition. Um, officers who start in a study leave the agency or they move on out of our groups that we're looking at. Um, into specialized units or administration. So you always have, but it was roughly um, about 400 that we got to the concluding point. We could look at them pre and post test framework. All right. Good to go, Arnold? Yep. Okay. All right, thanks, Jeff. Yeah, so what did we find? What were our findings from this evaluation? Um, let me. Um, so first of all, officers that completed the training broadly were significantly more likely to prioritize procedural justice during their interactions with citizens. So this is really important, of course, because it goes beyond simple de-escalation skills, which are important but narrow, as we talked about. And it leverages social interaction skills that we know improve community trust and legitimacy, while also simultaneously um, improving an officer's ability to gain compliance. Um, second, trained officers, those that, were, uh, that went through the experimental training, were more likely to focus on staying self-controlled during their interactions um, with members of the public. And that was kind of constrained to one of our uh, research locations, but nonetheless a significant finding. 
this is really encouraging because it really gets at the heart of many of the problems we see with excessive use of force situations. Cops like Chauvin in Minneapolis lost self-control and he made a terrible decision that resulted in uh, killing a, a, a man. This is partially due, incidents like this is partially due to the fact that many cops don't receive enough, any or sufficient training in how to maintain composure and self-control during their interactions with members of the public, of how to not take things personally when things slightly get out of control. Second, we found that dosage mattered. Officers that completed three months of training were those that were most likely to prioritize using procedural justice and maintaining self-control during their interactions with the public. And those that completed the high dose, so it should be six to seven months of training, were those that were the only group that we saw prioritize, or uh, only group that we saw place less of an emphasis on physically controlling an individual as their first resort during uh, interactions with the public. And so that's kind of like the de-escalation component to the training, right? Those officers that had a higher dose of training were significantly less likely to emphasize physical control as opposed to other priorities like uh, maintaining self-control and procedural justice. So this tells us a couple things. It tells us that longer training is more effective than one or two day training programs and that to change some of these issues that are related to problematic use of force among police officers will require a significant training duration commitment from police agencies, but also a commitment on the behalf of the entities that are responsible for funding that training. And then finally, what about our actual behavior? Not, not surprisingly here, we have a bit of mixed evidence. So in Fayetteville, use of force was really rare to begin with, and we saw no change in the amount of use of force among Fayetteville police officers. Big thing here to point out though, is that in many ways we see this as a policy and reporting problem rather than necessarily the training not being effective for those officers. So the Fayetteville Police Department, their use of force policy only required officers to fill out a use of force report if they took a subject to the ground, but that person was also injured. So if they took somebody to the ground and arrested them, if that person didn't complain of being hurt, didn't have an injury, it didn't get reported as a use of force. And so, of course, this is artificially deflating their use of force numbers within that agency. Now, when we look at the Tucson police officers, we saw that both experimental and control group officers were significantly, had significantly fewer uses of force, of, uh, you know, a little bit more of a downward trend among the experimental condition. And so this could be a statistical artifact, a statistical problem, just, you know, something that happened in the agency, or what's highly likely is that the training had somewhat of a diffusion of benefits effect. Even those officers that didn't go through the training kind of reaped the benefits from being around their colleagues that had completed the training. Another thing that we want to point out is that police officer receptivity to training of any type is very important. So what we found in our study is that officers were motivated to who were motivated to go into the training room and go through the three or six, seven months of training were significantly more satisfied with the training program, and then they were more likely to have attitudinal change as a result. And so that introduces an important question, how do we motivate our officers? Interestingly, what we found in our study among our cops is that a lot of that motivation comes from their supervisors. Police supervisors and command staff need to communicate the value of the training to their officers. They need to seek officers input and feedback from their experiences in the training room. And they need to ensure that training is administered in a fair manner across the agency. Officers that did not feel their agency and their supervisors did this were significantly less satisfied with the training program and did not have any attitudinal change as a result. And so what this suggests is that agencies need to own the training. It has to be part of their agency. It has to be their agency's training program. It has to be their officers that are administering, rolling out the training, as opposed to having it forced upon them. And then finally, we also would like to point out that this training, as, as Jeff kind of alluded to earlier and we'll touch on again, this, this training is very flexible. We can take this to a completely web-based view, interactive training environment. Um, and, and just research has found that Officers are receptive to this idea of completely web-based interactive training, which is encouraging. 
It's also encouraging because that format can ha help with a lot of the operational tempo, time, and money problems that have always been roadblocks to effective police training in years past. So Jeff, to you now. Yep, yep. So, um, you know, what we're talking about here, and, I, and, and to be broad, you know, this is one study looking at a new approach that tries to take a bigger version of taking these components of de-escalation, procedural justice, all those decision-making, empathy, self-control, and trying to package them in a more holistic way, which we train officers to think about social interactions. So they can maneuver in that very interactive dynamic and, and, and be nimble, if you will, to hopefully reduce outcomes and events. And there's more to this. Um, building on this now, we, so this study we just talked about was funded by the National Institute of Justice and the U.S. Department of Justice. We now have another project that builds out as working with this group tangentially still, but it's looking at how do I particularly um, improve officer decision making and, and how do I identify those who have essentially expertise versus novice and their skill sets and decision making and how can I train that essentially to improve that in a quicker time span instead of just waiting through a career to be better decision makers, particularly in a context of goal conflict where you have officers are waiting for or interacting with a safety concern to a citizen, a citizen's rights, a officer's safety, and how they switch and maneuver around those situations and who's better at it and how we train that to improve overall and all performance. So there's a lot of other components that go to this and a lot more work that needs to be done. Um, but let me say kind of concluding here, it's important to keep in mind. Um, there's a lot of pieces out there and a lot of frameworks about what we should do and what's not going to have an effect. And there clearly needs to identify programs that work and don't. I mean, very often our conventional wisdom, what will work, um, does not work. Um, I, Jennifer alluded to the sum of the work on um, diversification and policing, which is radically changed since uh, the 67 report, the, um, the President's Commission. And there's a lot of ways which we look at. I mean, people may see it in the context of, um, again, our officers still socialize a certain way. Others would argue that officers are put into an environment that's the same regardless of officers' racial or ethnic background, so they're still operating and they're going to behave very similar regardless of socialization. There's a lot of considerations, but one of the things I'll say is to not ignore the fact that we can have dramatic effects in policy and training these other areas to shape police behavior. And I'll give you one example, and I was reviewing some other material this morning. In 1971, NYPD had 810 shootings. 1972, it had 994. They instituted after that year some restrictions in not shooting fleeing felons and other elements. By 1973, they went down to 665 shootings. That's a one-third reduction in their shootings. But now, even more important, in 2019, NYPD had 52 shootings. The year before, 35. Policy training, these things have can have radical reductions. And so I think to not slip in that framework that we can't do anything, there's clear evidence that we can. The challenge, to be very honest with you, is policing is not equal in the United States. Some agencies are well-funded, some have more forward-thinking policies and are much more effective than others and how they respond to deal with problems. And that's one of the things we very often overlook is training is not equal by any means. Training or even policing is not equal across the United States. And even within organizations, it's just like any organization, some are more skilled than others, and you have to wrestle with that reality, particularly where folks who deal with very critical decision making. So some of the things in looking for when we think, at least in our narrow prospect of track, uh, training, some critical considerations when we look at training, one is this idea of deliberate practice, be repetitious. We cannot think that we're gonna train an officer through a four hour, eight hour, 16 hour session convinced convinced in a half day or two day, whatever it may be, and they're automatically just gonna change your behavior. You have, like any other skill development, you have to have repetition over time of training. Um, you have to consider the logistical challenges. One of the things that, and we've worked with some of the federal uh, training and support agencies, they wanna go in and just train an agency off the bat and get 50% of officers training in a week. That's not physically possible in a logistical sense. Um, to physically pull people out of their line of work, policing is not built say an equivalent would maybe be in, in the context of military we have forward leaning units you have those that get rotated out for rest and training to go back policing is constantly as a forward posture so it's very difficult to cycle officers out 
that give particularly repetitious training. You have to come up with creative solutions. And I think this gets back to um, Scott's point. The group we worked with, Polis, um, originally did these video-based trainings, which is one of the cornerstones of what they do to kind of negotiate between having a bunch of scenario-based training in person, which can essentially pull people out of the field and be very labor demanding and logistically challenging to what they had as video-based training. We did it in person in a, a training and a roll call session, but they've moved to a completely web-based format where you can have the same framework of going through decision points and training in a very distributed way. And again, from what we've seen, we've seen good receptivity. receptivities. Now, I'll be honest, maybe all of us feel this way. We ask officers about traditional online training, PowerPoints, videos, absolutely hate it. And I think that might be universal from folks. But when you put them a much more interactive video-based engagement and training, there is a lot of interaction and positive interaction and, and a like for it. Scott mentioned uh, considering who provides training, uh, a must consider audiences. The person providing the training has to be legitimate to the, and I, this isn't, we say this in a police context, but it, arguably it's in most other work environments. If you're gonna train officers on things in these skill sets, interaction, dizzy escalation, in these frameworks, they have to believe that that trainer fully understands the circumstances they're getting into as opposed to just lecturing at them in a hypothetical and they don't believe the trainer has a complete understanding. Who trains matters. Um, and then the idea that is we looked at here is consider interactions. If we're gonna focus on the potential interactions and negativity comes out of an use of force or even more tragic encounters, that the idea we have to train holistically. These are interactions dynamic and we have to train all the different skills and then in ways which we combine them so they're better trained to utilize them in different contexts. The second main point would be be evidence-based. As Scott alluded to in the beginning, there's a fair amount of training and, and we've, I've done some separate body work working with the Department of Justice looking at agencies and training in, in different contexts. And one of the things when we talk to administrators is they're constantly getting bombarded by people trying to sell. They're whatever it may be. There might be people out of policing completely and never have policing background. They might be retired police individuals who are continuing their career and they're trying to sell packages of training. And very often, and, and really across the board in most pleading, uh, police training, there's very little evidence based in the sense of a methodological sound research suggests this works as opposed to conventional wisdom. So we want to find programs if we're going to spend money on them that have actual support, particularly when we talk large sums. Another thing I would say is, I think the third point is if we're going to do training or it's going to take place, um, especially with state funds, it should be evaluated, particularly independently. Are we spending the money we weigh the way we want to? Um, if we start putting money towards programs that sound good and they are having little impact, I mean, and again, I, I'm sure this is not new to anybody in this, this chat. This is a common framework that we have to invest more in figuring out whether programs are actually meeting our goals or not. And we, in a police training realm, we very often fail in this area. We do not conduct the evaluation proper study to see what we're spending sometimes millions of dollars on or having any type of impact. Um, Arnold, I'll, I'll go ahead. I, I don't know if we have some questions. Sure. Uh, Scott, can you stop sharing the screen at this point so we can okay. uh, get the panel up there? I do have one question that has come up uh, for uh, Jeff or Scott. Do you think it's feasible to incorporate the T3 training into police academy training for new officers? Yeah, yeah. I absolutely. And I think, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll start. And, and, and as you'll know, Scott and I've worked a lot with each other. We'll end up playing off each other because I'll forget half the things I'm supposed to say. Um, but we, in the case of Tucson in particular, I know they've looked into, they really liked the video-based training frameworks and the flexibility of that platform in particular, because again, here we can train social interaction, but that framework has also been used to think about right now, there's discussions about how we change use of force policies and things like that. Well, it's not enough to just change the policy. You're going to have to train officers on it. And we've seen particularly Chicago did a program like this where they changed their policy. Then they worked with this organization to then do video-based trainings to look at the alignment and help officers see in real life situations and counters how I change, how a given counter was, would be a violation of that policy, a given counter would be a proper application, if you will. So it has a lot of flexibility that you can train a lot of different things, but I think the social interaction based program, absolutely. I, I think that, that was honestly one of our discussions. When we first went to the agencies, they're like, well, we should do an academy. And we're looking like, 
two things. From a measurable point of view, that's very difficult. It's a long time frame because even when individuals get out of academy, they don't have full independence in their decision making because we're training officers, et cetera. I think the other issue is that's great, but we still have people in the field. If this is an effective program, they need to be trained as well. So we looked at it as both an in-service and academy-based training. In this case, for measurement purpose, we looked only at the in-service framework, which is, to be honest with you, is very challenging because you have people who have set ways in the field and we're trying to change those dynamics as opposed to someone in the academy, but both are applicable. Scott, did I miss something? Yeah, no, it, just to, to kind of piggyback off of what you're saying, I think it's, it's, it's easily um, integrated into a, a training academy of any type. And what's nice about a, a training academy is you'll, you'll also have the time because all those, all, all those future cops are doing is training is it can be mixed with, you know, in-person uh, social interactions as well to kind of get d different areas of adult learning integrated into that training. But th the other big thing to point out too, and Jeff alluded to this is one of the big problems we see with police training is that there's a lot of training programs at the academy in many states are pretty good, but that's the training that they get for their entire career. And then they stop, they go to the firearms range, right? But they don't have continued repetitious training throughout their entire career on the number one thing that they do with the public. It's talk to them and interact with them. And so one of the big goals of broad-based social interaction training is overcoming that hurdle of how do we get officers throughout their career, even though we have these operational demands and limited number of police officers in many jurisdictions that we can't pull off the street all of the time, how do we get them good training over time? And so that's the flexibility of a, you know, of a social interaction program like this it, in terms of how it was um, rolled out in these agencies, whether you do it for an hour before or after roll call, very easy to have a big group of officers go through that repetitively, or um, some other mechanism, whether it's, you know, all web-based even, you know, makes it easier. Well, Scott and Jeff, um, you know, to, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, it, it's what Scott's alluding to is this challenge that I think Jennifer was, was pointing out, you know, you have these larger base problems that does, that need funding, right, to address some challenges. But the same token goes, if you want to improve behavior of law enforcement, and again, we've seen programs that can dramatically change, but you're going to have to invest in them. And, and, and I don't make light of that because I know it's very easy for us in academia to go, yeah, you need these broad based social programs, you need to train the police better. And the folks listening to this have to come up with the funding to do that. It's very easy for us to make those suggestions. And I realize the challenge of it, but also recognize the radical variation in the level of Scott was getting to of training across the country, um, where some have basic academy standards are at best 10, 12 weeks, where some have six to eight months. And what do we expect out of that base training? And then even after that, some have very minimal in-service training, where others have 40, 80 plus hours a month. Those are considerable variations and challenges we face in policing in the United States. And we would expect variation in performance to some degree. Right. Um, I'm sorry. So, go ahead. I, I'll rock. Yeah, no, it's okay. So uh, great stuff from all three of you, especially in light of the fact that uh, as we talked in preparing for this, uh, the Michigan legislature started moving legislation in the area of training. Uh, I believe it's passed out of the Senate and is now in the House of Representatives here in Michigan, still awaiting to see how that pans out, but very, very timely information. Because uh, as I recall, that legislation mandated specific trainings. It mandates implicit bias training. And what I hear you saying, and my takeaways from this, is that number one, the various trainings, such as implicit bias, uh, the crisis mental health training, uh, the procedural just justice training, really all fall under this broader framework of social interaction training. Um, and that there is no one silver bullet, number one, in this. Jennifer, I think you pointed that out. You know, you've noted that, yes, police departments have diversified greatly over the last 40 years. But you know, you noted in particular the um, the social catch twenty two that 
black or minority officers find themselves in when policing in, in their own community. So there's no one silver bullet. And the, along with that, the other thing that I heard is that this training must have a significant duration period. It can't be a one-off three-hour seminar and you're done thing. Um, certainly, uh, your DARPA information shows, yeah, the, I'm sorry, the Fayetteville and uh, certainly Tucson information does show now that um, duration training does work, especially under this T, T3 model, as, as you've so noted. So let me ask the three of you, uh, because as Jeff, you noted, we have here with us as attendees, legislative staff whose uh, bosses, the people they work for are, are making decisions right now about how to address um, these, uh, these issues. Any thoughts for them as they move forward? I mean, I know you've given me a lot of things to think about. I think you've given our attendees some things to think about, but you know, given the fact that there isn't a lot of uh, research work on much of this. Um, any thoughts that you want to uh, lay out for the legislative staff that's on this webinar as to what they and their uh, members should be thinking about as they craft legislation? I'll give you, for instance, should we be mandating specific trainings? Any thoughts? I'll, I guess maybe defer to Jennifer first because we have taken up a lot of air here in the last 15, 20 minutes. So I'm sure you guys would like to hear Jennifer again. So thank, thank you for that. Um, okay. Thank you for that question. Um, so I think um, in addition to, you know, there's been a lot of talk about training and I definitely understand um, uh, the need for more training. I mean, I, I, the only thing I would just say is, again, as I think um, was already mentioned by both doctors Rojek and Wolf, that, you know, we've been doing training, you know, police officers have been receiving training uh, for decades from implicit bias training to um, um, diversity training to de-escalation training. Um, but I, what I would say is missing from some of this conversation is really, uh, the need to address, you know, this America's history of racial injustice largely. And again, I'm speaking as someone who has done a lot of interviews with protesters and um, who are largely black and brown individuals, right? Often when people, uh, minority communities see um, the badge, they are seeing the history of racial injustice um, that has taken place. Um, and so I think it is important to consider how historical racial injustice continues to impact uh, black individuals' experiences with and perceptions of the police because there's a tendency to just focus on the incident or the issue, the, the contemporary issue at hand. Um, but um, it, the reality is, you know, the origin of policing, for instance, in the United States can be tied directly to the institution of slavery and uh, slave patrols were among the first state-sponsored police force that really controlled the slave population. Um, slave codes were established, which gave uh, where state laws defined the status of slaves and the rights of their owners, giving them absolute power to govern their slaves as chattel or, or property. But even when slavery was abolished, states relied on the legal system and prison system to create uh, policies that maintain racial subordination. For example, black codes were established, which created new, new offenses for certain types of behaviors like loitering and vagrancy, which were laws that were um, applied just selectively to African Americans. Anyone found in violation of these laws would be punishable by fines or imprisonment and forced labor. Um, and even when black codes were overturned, uh, states pursued racial segregation in an attempt to ensure um, uh, you know, white supremacy and black subordination. And so this is what led to the proliferation of Jim Crow, which is where various state laws uh, created different rules for blacks and whites. And so I only bring that up because um, there is a real, because I know I understand sometimes people are like, well, why are you looking back at the history? But um, the reality is um, 
this history is ingrained in you know law enforcement and so from when we look from slave patrols to slave codes and black codes and jim crow laws and now with mass incarceration where black and brown individuals are more likely to be arrested sentenced and incarcerated um uh, there has been a lot of um, racially biased legislation that has been in existence for centuries. And so I do think it's important to address America's history of racial injustice um, because any attempt to implement reform to the police without explicitly addressing the history of injustice and the deep trauma of harmed communities and the role that the law and its institutions have placed in producing it, um, I, I don't think it's going to be completely effective. And so while we know we certainly can't change history, acknowledging it um, with a commitment to, to do better and um, a commitment to reconciliation, I think that's part of the component that's often missing in some of these conversations. So Jennifer, you, you had pointed this out toward, there's something that you had pointed up toward the end of your presentation and that Jeff just noted, and that's resources and how we're, currently spending resources, and maybe that there is a need to shift resources. I was doing some reading the other day and a few news reports uh, about how, I, I can't remember the community, you know, when there is a, uh, a sexual assault call or a mental health call, mm -hmm. instead of sending someone in a blue uniform with a gun, a, a, a professional, a social service professional in that discipline is sent uh, instead or as well. Um, so, you know, when we hear about uh, when the discussion now is coming up of, and, and I'll say this, defunding the police, it's really more of a discussion is where are our resources going and are there situations where we're sending you know, police in where a mental health professional, a sexual assault professional, a sexual abuse professional would actually uh, do more good than sending an officer in. Yeah, so I will definitely say, I know that the term defund the police definitely makes people, uh, some people like cringe and get pretty upset. And, and I understand that. Um, and it depends how you're defining defund the police. The whole idea behind defunding the police is really that there should be massive restructuring of public spending priorities. Um, so it's calling really for a permanent reduction to existing, uh, to existing policing infrastructure. And so, because currently the way our government deals with um, uh, you know, neighborhoods is by overinvesting in policing and underinvesting in social support programs or job opportunities. And so, as you already mentioned, Arnold, like we look to the police to solve issues, a number of societal problems from issues of abuse, abandonment, homelessness, domestic disputes, school disruptions, unemployment, and a host of other societal uh, problems. Um, and we rely on the state to deal with these issues instead of looking to social workers, therapists, educators, and medical workers to help solve some of these problems. Um, and so we've been trying to turn police into social workers while eliminating the need for the number of social workers. We have been right. trying to turn police into mental health clinicians while at the same time failing to fund mental health services. And so, and I get why police officers are frustrated. Like we're giving them a host of responsibilities that they're not necessarily qualified for. We expect them to utilize violence when necessary if it means um, capturing, getting the quote unquote bad guy. But at the same time, we're also telling them to de-escalate, right? And so we were requiring a lot from them um, and because we rely on police officers really to be the first resort to handle a host of societal yeah. problems. Yeah. And so that's why I do argue, I made the argument about the importance of really investing a lot more in marginalized communities to help them to thrive. Um, and greater investments really do, need to be made in social services, education, housing, and public health, because when the, when you have stronger communities, that will result in reduced uh, crime rates, which will then affect uh, uh, the need um, and quality and type of policing that takes place in these neighborhoods. So I think you, you, you touched on this a bit. One question that come, comes, has come in asks, should police reform focus on de-escalating situations and classes on treating minorities better in order to strengthen community relations? And certainly 
you just noted about understanding the history, which I think is an important part of this. Yeah, I would argue definitely understanding the history is better. I mean, the only reason I just kind of, you know, there, the, it's not like there has not been training. Off, again, but as uh, uh, Dr. Rojak mentioned, you know, the training varies across police departments. But the reality is there has been training as it relates to uh, you know, racial bias and cultural training and um, de-escalation. Police officers are getting that. Um, now, the amount of training is, is certainly, or dosage is certainly another issue. But um, um, I guess if training is going to take place, I would definitely argue about the need to understand the history. Um, but then also, and then I'll give uh, both doctors uh, Rojek and Wolf an opportunity to speak as well. I will say that, for example, the National Initiative for uh, Building Community Trust and Justice at John Jay College um, of Criminal Justice, they've also developed what is called a police community reconciliation framework. I think I touched upon this at the end, um, where part of this, they understand the need to, um, it, it entails a structured process to help police and communities acknowledge and address the past and understanding each other better. Um, and there is an acknowledgement uh, by law enforcement of the harm um, that traditional policing has had on many vulnerable and marginalized communities um, and uh, in the past and even up into the present day and age. And then uh, another component is really bringing the police and members from the community together to express um, what they think and feel. The police are actively, or need to actively listen and hear the voices and experiences um, of community members. Community members can speak to their experiences and why they believe the things they do. Um, because we, rightly or wrongly, we know that perceptions, and certainly or people's perceptions are going to impact um, the way they view, view law enforcement. But it also entails having law enforcement uh, talk about their experiences as well and why they feel the way they do. And um, in addition, uh, together uh, during these uh, listening sessions, effort is made to come up uh, with police and community members to come up with um, uh, concrete ways to change policy and practices. Um, that's really grounded in this reconciliation process. But there is an acknowledgement of the harm that's been done, collecting and disseminating that information uh, to the public and recording it so that, uh, I, I think just, I think recording it and stating it, it goes a long way for many uh, community members to understand, okay, at least they're acknowledging that in traditional policing in many ways has been harmful and then making steps to try to uh, how can we actually repair some of these policies and practices and move forward in such a way that does not necessarily harm the community? Jeff, Scott, any further comment? Yeah, if, you, Scott, uh, Albert. yeah um, so, so two things, um, and both of which I, I won't speak for Jeff, but I think we we would pretty much agree with what Dr. Kobina has said on, on a couple points is, um, for one, about the, the funding issue, I think honest conversations definitely need to be, be uh, taken place about the funding priorities of police agencies relative to the other things that we need in society. One thing we'll point out going back to, to at least Jeff and I's research is this broad-based social interaction training format, especially in the manner in which we evaluated it under, and certainly if it is all web-based, um, it's really cheap um, and efficient. And so, and, and the, the other thing that I'll bring up that, that Dr. Kamita hit on that, that I agree with is it's important for officers to understand and acknowledge um, the history of strained police relations in the United States. Um, and what's, what's really interesting, so Jeff and I and our colleagues that worked on this project, one of the things we did during the evaluation of, of, of this in, in both Fayetteville and Tucson was we sat in the training rooms and watched them. Um, and so these were, you know, about hour long video. Mostly they were body cam, sometimes cell phone, video of real interactions in other agencies, which helps the officers in the, in the training room kind of distance themselves. It's not us, you know, type of situation and, and try to learn from those interactions. On a number of occasions, I know I witnessed conversations during the stopping points that revolved around race. And some of them were from African-American or uh, Latinx officers in the room, especially in Tucson, of trying to have conversations with their colleagues and their colleagues learning that 
the the individual that's portrayed in the in, in the body cam or the cell phone video may be interact may be doing a, you know behaving in a certain way because of some of the things they've experienced in the past and so what's interesting about that training format is especially when you have multiple officers in the room or in a zoom format like this that you could have right is they can learn from each other and so those conversations about how race ethnicity plays into interactions with the public are not lost among police officers. Um, they know it. A lot of them do. There's certainly there's cops that don't and don't want to acknowledge it, but many of them do. And they can help officers in their agencies learn those important lessons by going through that training. Well, Scott, you just touched on something. I think that was that's actually a question here about the video based training what's it like is it virtual reality based something else and you just noticed that a lot of it was cell phone and body cams it is yeah so most of the videos and and what's nice about it is you can tailor it to maybe potential needs of the agency on the fly um, and lots of different interactions um, through publicly available body cams your own body cams partner agencies or cell phone videos um, to learn about a number of different things that officers may encounter. And what's nice about the train, the purpose of training is to slow things down, right? And so in that training room, you can stop that video at pre-programmed spots where you as a trainer or the trainer it, 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 you know, at hand might want to have a conversation or a, a, you know, a, a teachable moment about that interaction, right? I'm sorry, one other question that's come through is if it would be beneficial for police to attend classes at maybe a local law school um, so that they, uh, you know, are interacting with their communities while they learn. Um, I mean, is there any type of off-site thing like a local law school that might uh, be of uh, benefit here? I don't. I don't envision, I mean, it, there, there's so many different fundamental aspects. If I was to prioritize, I think these elements of decision-making and other frameworks, I mean, there, when I apply a framework to legal and we can improve what the legal training officers are getting, I think legal is but the aspect of an interaction they need to learn how to apply. And I'm not sure if that's the framework as opposed to training them better to read a situation and interaction. But, I mean, getting back to your larger point, and I think even for, you know, you, you look for Scott Jennifer, Fry, there's points of confluence and points of difference in perspective. This is a complex, long lasting problem. And the complexity, even in agreement in history, um, you have Jennifer talks about the aspect of um, history of slave patrol and service, other dynamics that map into race over time, but there's a whole other dynamic of policing. I mean, the major departments in policing in the United States are not born out of that frame. They're born out of a British model that came into Northeast and Midwest United States that had a very different orientation of democratic policing. But over time, some of these issues map together with regard to race and all these other factors. And understanding that complex history even, because if you don't understand the social functional role, it becomes really easy to say dismantle police and understanding why that exists absent a race context. But if you think only about the social functional role, you ignore the history of race coming into play. And so these are they're complex issues. And I, you know, I think when we look, what I would argue is to very often in these contexts, you, we want to come up with very quick solutions to do something, we want to fix the problem. This, even the existence of policing in any individual rights democratic society is a very difficult aspect in the sense we want limited government control, but we put these into play, are always going to be in a precarious position. And think about if we're looking to improve them, this is an ongoing effort. Even if it's the training, it's something you're constantly adjusting, evaluating, improving. It's not like we can grab three things off the shelf, put them in a play and go, and we're good. And it's going to reduce the problem. Um, so, you know, I guess my argument would be, I realize there's times in after kind of major crisis events, you have to do something to make some change. But I would hope there's a, a, a deeper investment from folks in the legislature with other folks who have experience and even across the both the communities and law enforcement to put something more permanent that goes forward and it's continually evolving to evaluate and improve because otherwise we're just simply doing the same thing. We're constantly just looking for a quick solution um, to a crisis. Let, let me ask this question based on, because you just brought something up, Jeff, uh, involving communities. What, what, any advice from the three of you about what communities, you know, citizens or nonprofits can be doing to encourage the strategies you outline? Um, 
a lot of pressure obviously coming now from citizens and nonprofits and community advocacy groups. So any advice on that end? You know, I think it's hard in particular because sometimes you'll have competing goals and a variety of community groups as well as obviously with police and other political part uh, frameworks. Um, you know, I've seen effective models. I'll give you an example because I was a part of it. Um, Jennifer and I both went to grad school in Missouri, um, University of Missouri, St. Louis, and I worked in a program early on. Um, Missouri uh, State Attorney General at the time, and it's now an ongoing problem, put in play a traffic stop analysis for every agency in the state by legislation that submit their data, including race characteristics of their driver stop. But I thought one of the best ways that they did this and put this program into play is when the first year they did it, they brought representation from, a, it's not necessarily community groups, but leading organizations representing civil liberties, representing the African American community in particular, because that's heavily where the concern was coming into play to put this legislation in play. And the formation of what the focus, what the, the data collection aspects were, and law enforcement in the room and, and the Attorney General, was a confluence of some type of opinion. Not Nobody ever leaves them at getting exactly what they want, but it was bringing together parties. And so when to somehow address a data collection legislative problem. And I would suggest, at least when you're talking about broad based things about how we train, how we wanna focus on a policing, you, you, it's reasonable to bring all these parties into play. Mm -hmm. The challenge is, is how do you do it in an efficient, effective manner um, that doesn't get lost in constantly kind of minutia and handling um, different perspectives and competing goals and actually try to move forward because it's very easy whether it be you bring the police all together and they can't agree on anything, let alone you bring the police, community groups, advocacy groups, uh, political party, uh, political affiliates together, the leadership to make something, common points of agreement go forward is very difficult. Jennifer, any final thoughts uh, as we uh, close out this session that you'd uh, like to leave with our attendees? Um, well, the only thing I'll just bring up that hasn't necessarily been discussed is there is also a lot of scholarship showing that under policing also leaves a lot of residents feeling perpetually under, under, underserved and underprotected and unsafe. Um, um, and many residents have complained about ineffective policing for centuries, including, you know, officers being rude or the, the incredible the slow response time or the lack of empathy for crime victims. Um, and so as a result, many um, high, uh, residents who live in these high crime neighborhoods have long concluded that police are either incapable of keeping them safe or unwilling to do so. Um, and so as a result is you do have a lot of uh, black and brown communities that are suffering from the worst of both worlds, right? Where there's in some cases the over aggressive, the over -aggressive policing behavior in, in uh, with frequent encounters with residents, especially for minor types of offenses. Yet on the other hand, this is coupled with the inability of, uh, or, um, of law enforcement to effectively uh, protect um, uh, public safety in, in these neighborhoods. And so um, I will say that there are a lot of black civilians who do see police uh, as having an important role in efforts to try to control crime. However, it's the brutality, the violence, the racism that does erode faith um, in law enforcement in these neighborhoods. Um, because uh, poor police performance gradually chips away um, at law enforcement's legitimacy, especially when, again, it occurs along with frequent harassment of particularly young Black individuals. Um, so I, I will say, I think that there are some crime reduction strategies that can be effective and just. For instance, there is um, compelling evidence that focused deterrence strategies can be effective. So that's where this type of strategy relies highly on data to identify high risk individuals and groups for interventions and then customizing social services uh, to these individuals rather than casting a wide net of criminal suspicion over entire black and brown neighborhoods. That's when we run into problems. And so um, an example is I, uh, the Boston um, Operation Ceasefire uh, was credited with almost two thirds, uh, a month, um, two thirds a monthly drop in youth homicide during the 1990s when they used this approach. And so um, I, I think city leaders could certainly embrace innovative strategies that enlist the help of community partners with expertise and training that officers might lack. Um, such as using, again, some of these 
deterrence uh, focused deterrence strategies, not broad based deterrence strategies where we're going to uh, individuals in high crime neighborhoods and assuming that all residents are engaged in criminal activity um, because that's when distrust occurs and there's less cooperation with the police. Um, uh, and so if data is used to focus on high risk individuals, um, that I think has, has been shown to be effective um, and, and should be utilized if we're talking about uh, what else to do and how else to move forward. On top of, I'm always going to encourage the need to invest more in, in marginalized communities. Thank you, Dr. Kabina. Scott, any, uh, any final thoughts? No, that's it. I, I agree with a lot, a lot of what Dr. Kamita said. She said it better than I could. Okay. Uh, Jeff, anything else you'd like to add before we uh, close this session? No, I, I think um, Jennifer made a good point. I think we've all been tracking on this is, is you're trying to find these balances and, and um, Jennifer related to me something I recently just read some reporting in particular out of Baltimore where we, we focus on these critical events and the things we don't like in policing, right? And the need for accountability or change. And, um, but the problem is you want to do that in a way that the police still do what we want them to do. And maybe we have others handle some of their jobs, but we still need them to do theirs. And, and some of the reporting out of Boston and some of the, the, the investigative reporting I've seen recently where, uh, not Boston, Baltimore, where obviously you had an issue with the Freddie Gray case and the problems of a lack of accountability and overaggressive policing and things like that. But you now have a really tragic story that's going on where you have a reduction, probably about 15% of police force, but even that, a lack of engagement and wanting to be involved in the police officers, at least what's reported. And you've seen an astronomical rise in the homicide rate and community members going, I think as Jennifer saying, I don't want you to do nothing. I want you to do a better and I want you to still do something and serve the community that has challenges. And so I think in all these discussions, and I think Jennifer put it in there, so, you know, we talk about defunding, this very thoughtful thinking about repercussions of our actions in all different ways and trying to address the problem. Um, this, is, this is not easy. These are complex social problems that the police get thrown into and there may be better ways we can address them, but there may be ways in which we also improve the policing and their response to make sure the services are being done. It's not a one or the other. Either we have police and over aggressive or they just don't do anything. Um, you need effective policing, if you will. Well, I want to thank you all, Dr. Gabina, Dr. Rojek, Dr. Wolf, for taking time to be, be with us today, share uh, the knowledge that you bring to the table, the perspectives, and uh, hopefully some uh, different ways for uh, legislative staff to go back to their bosses and say, hey, I heard something today that we should be paying attention to as we move forward on these discussions. And uh, um, hopefully, um, uh, maybe include folks such as yourself in those discussions. The only way we have, uh, we get to good policy is through the good academic work that folks such as yourself are doing. And I greatly appreciate the work that you're doing. So again, thank you for being here. And uh, to our attendees, thank you for joining us today on this uh, webinar of IPSER's uh, Legislative Staff Training Series. Uh, it has been recorded and will be posted to the IPSER website uh, later this week. Uh, also, please feel free to join us at one o'clock today where we'll have Drs. Charlie Ballard and John Goderis, MSU economists, discuss uh, the uh, growing wage, racial wage gap and also a professional development session featuring uh, Jamie Hutchinson, an associate director in MSU's work-life office, talking about uh, recognizing and minimizing burnout in uncertain times. So thank you all again and uh, have a good day. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Good to see you guys.